All right, so what I have next is some general uh, or a brief overview of properties of a steel pipe. Again, the focus of this course is steel pipe, right? So we want to review some of the properties that uh, a steel pipe might have. Uh, like any other pipeline, when you have a pipe, whether it's steel or plastic or whatever, there are some existing stresses in the pipe that you have to account for them when you do surface loading analysis. There is a hoop stress in the pipe. When the pipe is pressurized, naturally you get a hoop stress in the pipe. And uh, because we are dealing with a buried pipe here, there is also a axial or a longitudinal stress just because of the pressure. When you pressurize the pipe, that pressure uh, creates a longitudinal stress as well. Uh, then in the axial direction of the pipe, we could have thermal stress. And in fact, most of the times we do have thermal stress, which we have to account for because they just add up, right? So we have to account for all those stresses. And sometimes there are other stresses. Sometimes there is a pipeline. Um, we could have existing stresses from the construction or from uh, ground subsidence or settlement, if uh, subsidence or settlement took place in the past, right? So those are um, examples of stresses that we ha actually have to account for. So sometimes we refer to these stresses as existing stresses. Now, uh, what is stress versus strain? Uh, the engineering definition of stress is this. It's load divided by cross-sectional area. This is a one-dimensional example. Suppose you have a rod, you have a, uh, a truss member, and uh, you apply an axial load to that, right? There is an axial load, either compression or tension. The rod has a cross-sectional area as well. If you take the load and divide it by the cross-sectional area of the rod, that gives you the stress. Now, the rod that is under stress is going to either get, if, if the stress is tensile, it's gonna um, get a little bit longer. If the stress is compressive, it gets a little bit shorter, right? So we have a delta L. Delta divided by original length of the rod is a strain. This is how we define the stress and the strain in under uniaxial loading. So one dimensional loading is known as uniaxial loading. Uh, there is load in along one axis of uh, of the structure only. If you have a three axial loading, uh, we can define a stress and a strain in similar ways. And as you know, a stress and a strain under three three axial loading is going to be a matrix uh, or a tensor. But but the idea is the same. We divide load by area. That's a stress. We divide the amount of deformation by the original length, and that becomes a strain. The unit for a stress is uh, same as pressure, like PSI or megapascal. The unit for a strain is uh, unitless. A strain doesn't have a unit. Now, under a uniaxial tensile test, uh, now what's the example of a uniaxial tensile? If you get a specimen of a sample, like a dog bone, a specimen of a pipe, and uh, test it under uh, a load, uh, load frame, just a simple tensile test. That's a uniaxial tensile. Under uniaxial tension, we get a stress strain curve like this. Here on the x axis, I have a strain. On the y axis, I have a stress. And the reason that strain goes on the x axis is usually. It, this is because usually when we do a tensile test, strain is the independent variable because uh, the load frame pulls the sample, the specimen at a constant rate, right? The, the rate could be, I don't know, 1% per minute or something like that, right? So we apply stress, strain, we apply deformation, we measure stress. Strain becomes independent variable, stress becomes dependent variable. But it's not always like that. So I will talk about it a little further. But for now, um, with a strain being on the x axis and a stress being on the y axis, the curve looks like this. The initial part of the curve is a line that is known, known as the linear elastic part. Then at some point, the specimen is going to yield. And beyond yielding, we get plasticity and nonlinear response. Okay. 
So we have a yield point, and uh, there are different ways to define yield point. Uh, pipeline people define yield point but based on half percentage strain. If you look at the uh, orange line here, this vertical line, that schematically shows a half percent strain, right? It, this this line, this vertical line is just put at 0.5 percent. And wherever this line crosses the stress strain curve, that defines the yield strength, or um, what's known as SY sometimes. That's the yield strength. Now, structural engineers have a different way to define yield strength. It's called the 2% offset, 0.2%, uh, sorry, not 2%, 0.2%. So instead of half percent, they uh, start at 0.2%, but the line is not vertical line. It has a slope. It parallels the initial part of the curve, right? And then wherever it, it crosses uh, the stress strain curve, that becomes the yield strength. So there are different definition and the end result could be slightly different. When you look at, look at the lab report, make sure you pay attention on how they defined uh, the yield. It shouldn't make a huge difference, but it can make a little bit of a difference which, which definition we use. All right. Now, usually, um, in many cases, when we perform stress analysis on a pipe, we assume that the pipe is linear elastic all the way. We basically ignore plasticity, uh, especially in surface loading analysis. We just ignore plasticity. We just assume that pipe is linear. So what, are, what does it mean for a pipe to be linear elastic? It means that we can use the Hooke's law to correlate stress and strain. In other words, under uniaxial condition, stress is equal to what is known as the elastic modulus or Young's modulus times the strain. So we have this simple relationship, right? And uh, th th this is one reason we use, uh, we ignore plasticity because it just makes things very, 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 very easy because stress is basically, uh, Young's modulus times a strain. If I know uh, my Young's modulus, which is usually 30 million PSI, Young's modulus for carbon steel is close to 30 million PSI, right? So I know the Young's modulus. If I know a strain, I can calculate the stress. If I know a stress, I can calculate the strain. A easy relationship. Now let's apply this relationship to uh, yield yield point. Let me go back to previous slide. I said the yield point is a strain that is equal to 0.5%, right? Now, if I multiply 30 million by 0 0.005, this is the strain, 0.5%. Then I get a stress that is 150,000 PSI, okay? So this is greater than uh, the grade of a typical line pipe. A typical line pipe, we say that SMICE is uh, 42,000 or 30, 35,000 for grade B, 42,000, all the way to maybe 100,000, grade X100, 100, 100. We don't have a line pipe that's 150. So, so what's happening here is because I'm using that elastic simplification, I'm getting a yield strength that is much, much higher than the actual yield strength of the pipe, right? So here we have to be careful a little bit when we do calculations. Uh, again, the image that I have here to the right explains why we, uh, why the two numbers diverge. Uh, when we use the linear uh, stress strain relationship, that is the blue line, right? But the actual behavior of the pipe is uh, the orange line. After yielding, uh, we get that nonlinear behavior. Okay, so at 0 0.5 strain, which is by definition uh, the yield point, the actual stress in the pipe is this much, where the vertical green line crosses uh, the stress strain, uh, stress strain line. So this is where I have my laser pointer. This is the actual yield. But when I use the linear relationship, I'm here. It puts me here, right? 
So, uh, in the, w when uh, again, the point here is be careful. Uh, we can use the linear relationship uh, for stress levels up to about 90% SMICE. Okay. When the stress exceeds about 90% SMICE, then we have to account for nonlinear effects. It also tells us that there is some layer of uh, conservatism in uh, uh, most of the calculations that we do, because usually we use this equation to calculate stress. And so uh, it gives me a stress that is greater than the actual stress in most cases. But anyway, the point here is to be careful uh, about when about using the linear uh, stress strain idealization. All right. Now we have another concept. The other concept that we have is a true stress strain. You might have heard this uh, terminology. Uh, instead of engineering a stress strain, sometimes people talk about the true stress and the true strain. The true stress and the true strain is when you measure stress and strain, not with respect to the original configuration, but with respect to the deformed configuration of a structure, right? A structure under load is going to deform and deflect. So the geometry changes. If you measure the stress and the strain in terms of the deformed geometry, that is the true value of the stress and the true value of the strain. And with some um, reasonable assumptions, we can show that the true stress is, uh, this is the true stress sigma, is equal to the engineering stress. S is the engineering stress. So the true stress is equal to the engineering stress times engineering strain plus one, right? And then we can also show that the, the true strain uh, is basically the result of this integral. And if you take this integral, you get a logarithm. This is natural or Neperian logarithm. So the true strain is a Neperian logarithm of engineering a strain plus one. So we have these relationships under uniaxial loading. Under uh, biaxial or triaxial loading, the relationship gets a little bit complex, more complex, but again, there are mathematical uh, relationships between them, which I'm not gonna cover today because uh, we don't use them in a surface loading. And here again, I have a schematic uh, comparison between true and engineering stress strain curves. This curve is the engineering stress stress curve response, the lower one. And again, it, it's schematic. Um, the true stress strain curve is the one that, that is at the top, this one. And if you look at them carefully, there are some um, differences. When we look at the true curve, there is no peak point. Engineering curve has a peak point here, right? So it goes up peaks and then it becomes uh, undergoes softening whereas the true curve doesn't have that softening it's just uh, monotonically increasing uh, the true strain values are lower than engineering strains the true stress values are greater than engineering stresses but the difference is not that significant it's not significant as long as you are uh, within, uh, if your stress is below the yield stress uh, before the pipe experiences yielding, the difference between engineering and the true values is insignificant. So we can use the engineering values instead of the true values. Now, the, the reason why we are using engineering values is because if you look at the true values, we have this logarithmic equ equation, right? This, this makes everything nonlinear because logarithm is a nonlinear function. So if we want to use, if, if we wanted to use the true values, then we couldn't use superposition and many other simplifications that we use. Right? So whenever possible, we like to use engineering, stress and strain instead of the true values, just to simplify things. Now, we also have another phenomenon that's known as the necking and necking happens, uh, uh, is uh, one of the things that is observed during a tensile test. 
Uh, and I have examples here that I will try to show it. This is a, a tensile test, a uniaxial tensile test. So we got uh, call it uniaxial because they have a rod and they pull the rod in one direction only. It's the axial direction of the rod. Uh, they will continue the test until the rod uh, uh, breaks, splits into two halves. The necking is going to occur here where I'm showing, uh, where I'm pointing to with my mouse. And if you look closely, you will see that before the failure, it gets narrow. That, that's what we call necking. Okay. See, it's getting narrower right here. Okay, so that was necking. Uh, uh, we also have load control versus displacement control. Uh, stress. A displacement control stress is a stress that is generated due to the movement of the pipe. Example of that is settlement. If you get ground settlement or geohazard issues, they usually create a load control stress. Thermal stress is another example. Displacement control is less critical than load control. And the reason for that is because once the material yields, now before yielding, there is not much difference between displacement control stress and load control stress. But after yielding, displacement control stress does not increase proportional to the displacement anymore. The stress increases at a rate that's much lower, much slower uh, than the increase in the displacement. And here is why. Displacement control is like a uniaxial test, like the example, the YouTube example that we saw. We apply a displacement, and that displacement induces a stress in the steel, right? So up before yielding, before this is where yielding occurs, this point of the stress strain curve. Before yielding, they are proportional. If you increase the displacement by uh, a factor of two, your stress increases by a factor of two. But after yielding, because uh, the tangent modulus drops, you can increase the displacement, and that increase is not going to cause that much increase in the stress, right? So that's a displacement control. And that's uh, less critical as compared to a load control. What is load control? Load control is this. If I apply a load to the pipe directly, like the internal pressure, that's a load control, right? Now, if you increase the internal pressure in a pipe or any type of load control, the stress, if you increase the load by a factor of two, the stress will increase by a factor of two, whether you are, whether the pipe is yielded or past the yield point, it doesn't matter. It's always proportional to the load. What, which means that if you are here, here is the yielding point, right? If the pipe is at yield, and if you apply, uh, if you increase the load just by a little bit, it's gonna take you to the rupture, right? So that's why it's more critical. Now, uh, surface loading in most cases, it's a combination. In real life, things are not uh, simple, right? So in real life scenarios, uh, the pipe might be uh, somewhere in between the load controlled and a displacement controlled condition. Uh, and surface loading is one of those cases, but it's closer to the load controlled condition. That's why when we are dealing with surface loading problems, uh, we should not allow the pipe, we cannot allow the pipe to yield. Um, you might be familiar with strain-based design. When you are dealing with geohazard problems, sometimes you can allow the pipe to yield under geohazard problems. That's called the strain-based design. The gear welds are designed for uh, to handle um, up to 2% of the strain from geohazard. The reason we can do that is because geohazard is a, dis a stre displacement control stress, right? We can't do that with surface loading in general generally speaking, uh, because surface loading is closer to displacement, to load controlled uh, stress. Uh, 
and uh, now this is gonna take me to the way this ties in into surface loading is uh, the allowable limits what are the allowable limits uh, this is the basically what uh, what is allowable limit for surface loading problems it's the yield strength of the pipe so in other words if the pipe material and if the girth welds are in sound condition if you don't have any girth weld or uh, seam weld integrity issues if there are no other stresses that are not accounted for because sometimes there are pre-existing stresses on the pipe and you need to account for them right so if you account for all the stresses and if the pipe is in good shape uh, as long as the stresses remain within the yield strength of the pipe we are in good shape that's acceptable right now of course we have a safety factor so when we talk about allowable the actual allowable stress limits it's based on based on the yield strength of the pipe but there is also a design factor that's applied to them and here on this table i have an example now remember this table i i did not update this this table for a while this is just for demonstration so i recommend that uh, instead of using this table you actually use the standard itself but just just as an example b314 the limit for the hoop stress under internal pressure is 72% SMICE, right? We are familiar with that. Now, when we have a hoop stress, there are some other limits. For example, there is a limit for the longitudinal stress in B314. There is a limit for uh, the thermal stress, expansion stress. This is mainly for above ground piping. Uh, we have a limit for the equivalent combined stress, right? And then we also have effective stress at road and railroad crossing. There is a limit for that, which is 90% SMICE, okay? So when, with surface loading problems, then we have uh, a couple of limits that we have to check. Obviously, the pipeline has to be within its design limits. So the hoop stress from internal pressure should be limited to 72% SMICE, right? Then the additive hoop stresses. What is additive hoop stress? It is the hoop stress from internal pressure plus hoop stress from surface loading. That should be limited to 90% to SMICE, right? Same way, the axial or the longitudinal stress in the pipe should be limited to 90% to SMICE. And the effective stress, which I'm going to define what that is, it's the same as von Mises stress or um, sometimes a Tresca stress. That should be limited to 90% SMICE. Now, if you review ASMEB 31.8, you have similar limits. If you look at the Canadian standard, same story. You have similar limits uh, that should be checked under surface loading. Okay. So, again, the takeaway here is... Uh, uh, the allowable limits for surface loading is based on yield strength of the pipe, based on the grade of the pipe.